Hello, uh, prospective Year 12 English students. Welcome. Welcome to the greatest subject in the world. Uh, I'm Mr Fitzgerald, Head of English and Assistant Head Teacher at the school. And I, I begin with that phrase, the greatest subject in the world, because uh, we, your English teachers, passionately believe that. Um, why? Why do we think English is so magnificent? Why do we think you've made uh, the best choice to study A-level English literature? Let's have a look. And the first thing I must therefore do is share the screen. Um, and hopefully we can make the technology work just perfectly. So as English teachers, we have discussed what we think English is and we've come up with this particular definition. We believe in the power of literature to provide opportunities for you to visit worlds beyond your own and to shed light on the one in which you already live. The texts that you are to study at A-level help to do that to a significant degree. You visit worlds beyond your own, perhaps taken to um, Afghanistan in one text, America in the, the 1920s in the case of another. Uh, and ultimately we look at these texts so that we can decide, well, what impact do they have on the way that we view the world in which we live, which is exactly what the, the um, screen says. Now, this is the first in a series of videos um, for your induction. Um, this first one will prioritise what the course is. So the course is this, and, and what we work towards is this. Um, you have two exams, which are both worth 40%, and then some coursework, which will be referred to as the NEA, which stands for Non-Examined Assessment, which is worth 20%. You can see there the amount of time that you get for each particular exam, as well as the weighting, the percentage weighting for, for them as well, how much um, they count towards your overall grade. Now we're going to spend a little bit of time just going through this reasonably quickly. A little bit of time, but not too much time. So the first paper is uh, on the concept of literary genres. And the example that we uh, do the exam with, AQA, as most of you would have done for your GCSEs, they provide us some choices and we have to operate within those frameworks. Now the short, the long and short of it is, is that we study and teach aspects of tragedy. So we are looking at um, what it says here on the screen, the long tradition in English literature um, of tragedy with their origins in the ancient world. Texts are selected and grouped together because they share some of the common features of traditional tragic drama. So, that's exciting. You're probably more interested in, well, what are the texts? You, some of you may know, of course. The key to it is that we are looking at it as um, a genre. It's not necessarily just about the text, it's how that text fits into the overall concept of the, the genre of tragedy. So the first, some of the first things that we need to do are to pin down exactly what tragedy is and what are those uh, features of the genre itself, because then that enables us to consider how much or how little the text conforms to those ideas. The second bullet point just informs you that when you do the exam for this particular paper, um, aspects of tragedy, you don't get a copy of the text, and therefore it places some responsibility upon you to, to know the text incredibly well, to ideally know some quotations. Um, but the most important thing that you'll hear us reiterate throughout this is knowing the plot, knowing the plot, knowing the text. Um, if you can point to moments, that's the most important thing. So knowing the text really well is essential. These are the texts. We have Othello, um, The Moor of Venice by William Shakespeare. You've got details there of particularly the ISBN number, so where it says ISBN 13, put that number into Google uh, or, or deliver it to your local bookshop and they will be able to order this text for you because that's what we'd like you to do is to order the text. We have Othello, Richard II and then The Great Gatsby uh, by F. Scott Fitzgerald. The reason that there is no um, ISBN number for Gatsby is because there are really so many versions it doesn't matter too much which one you go for. Um, the same is true of Othello and Richard II. Um, broadly speaking, we think either the Arden versions 
or the Oxford Shakespeare are particularly helpful. Why do we choose these tests? Well, AQA provide us with some choice. We are required to do some Shakespeare and we think that Othello is a fantastic choice. Um, I suspect that in the light of the um, Black Lives Matter movement over the last uh, few months, that there'll be some interesting discussions to be had about race and the treatment of Othello as a consequence of his being black um, in, uh, in our lessons. Uh, Richard II is a text which is remarkably straightforward in terms of the plot um, and, and reasonably straightforward in terms of knowing the, uh, the tragic elements of the text. Uh, there's, some, there's a really good uh, a TV adaptation of that which stars Ben Whishaw um, as Richard II, which we will take a look at at times during the course of the study of the text. And then The Great Gatsby, um, perhaps the archetypal A level, AS level, sort of year 12 text. Um, and it tends to be that that we start with. Now, your lessons will be divided um, between two teachers, typically, with one teacher being responsible for this paper and then the other teacher being responsible for the second paper, which is texts and genres. Again, we have a choice. Um, we can choose either crime writing or the one which we do choose, which is political, social and protest writing. And effectively what we look at with this is what's the writer's problem? What's their agenda? What's their beef? What exactly are they protesting about and against? And so when we study these texts, that's our overarching framework. What's their problem? Why do they get out of bed on this particular day to write that text? What irked them? What irked them so? Now the screen details that there are certain um, options and expectations. Ultimately, we have to study one text from after the year 2000, one poetry text, and then another text of our choice, which is from before 1900. So we make the choices that we do uh, for both papers based on what we have seen to serve students best over the last number of years. This particular screen I might pay a little bit more focus to, um, and I'll read it. Although it could be claimed that all texts are political, I pull a face there because some of you may have not necessarily considered that at all, but let's put it this way. If I, uh, I a sort of middle class white bloke from leafy Hertfordshire, decides to write a text about you know, schools in Hoddesdon or something, um, I might not think that it's a political text. I may not think that there's any kind of political backdrop to it, but the fact that I am a middle class white bloke from leafy Hertfordshire is likely to inform the text to some degree, whether I am conscious of it or not. So, all texts could be considered political, but in this instance, what we are looking at is are the issues of power and powerlessness at their core. And those two words there are perhaps the most important for this half of the course. Power and powerlessness. Who has power? Who doesn't have power? Why? How? What point is the writer making? Those are the ideas that we're going to look at. The second bullet point details that all the texts um, foreground, they discuss and talk about oppression and domination. They all look at the cultures in which we live and have lived over a period of time. Elements is the most important word because it's not a, an exercise in ticking a box to say, look, it has this element, it has this element, it has this element. We're looking at the fact that some of these texts we may not necessarily think as being overtly political or uh, protesty, <laughs> brilliant English, but pro they're not incredibly strong in their protest but there are elements of that within it. And uh, it's those elements that we are likely to focus on without it being a tick box exercise. 
I will leave this on the screen for a few moments for you to have a, have a read of it, because these are the things that you're likely to discuss in your classes. The first bullet point there is about text type, genre. The second is about the sort of backdrop, the context of the story. The third bullet point there is about the specific, as it says, the specific nature, the way that the characters in the story act. Fourth is about power, powerlessness. Fifth, the nature of class, perhaps. Uh, the last one there is about who has control. And then you have more of them here. Have a quick read. Okay, now at the moment, we don't want you to do too much with bullet points like this. It's a case of knowing that they exist and knowing that as and when you begin to read, these are the sorts of things that we would like you to consider. What texts will we study? We start with the Kite Runner. Again, you've got the ISBN number there to enable you to buy it. Um, then we have Songs of Innocence and Experience by William Blake, which is a collection of poetry. And then we have uh, further poetry by Tony Harrison. Now, of those, we ask that you purchase the Kite Runner. Um, Songs of Innocence and Experience, we, we are able to provide that to you along with Tony Harrison poems. However, the reason that there is an ISBN number there is so that should you wish to buy them, should you wish to read the poems early uh, and familiarise yourself with them and perhaps annotate them, then you have uh, the text to do it. If you do buy the text, you've also got one of the great texts of English literature, so it's not necessarily a problem to have um, more texts. Uh, students who read and who read widely um, tend to do quite well in English. What are these stories about? The Kite Runner is about um, a boy in Afghanistan and it details his journey into adulthood, the way that he treats others, the way that others treat him, the way that others treat others, um, and effectively takes us on a journey of discovery, a set against a backdrop of, you know, a country being torn apart. And it's that which underpins the protest in the novel. Um, the poetry by William Blake uh, has a sort of fairly overt religious subtext, um, which both celebrates divinity at the same time as criticizing the institutions of the church and the establishment, government, monarchy which in theory should be able to help those in poverty. And um, if I draw your attention to William Blake's poem, London, that many of you would have studied uh, for your GCSEs, that gives you a bit of an idea of the, the kind of subject matter that you might look at there. Uh, and Tony Harrison's poems um, are fantastic. We choose Tony Harrison because students tend to write about it really well. They're, they're reasonably straightforward poems, which are perhaps just quite sweary, really. Um, but what, what's he's, what is he interested in? What is his protest about and against? Uh, it typically concerns identity, uh, language, class, and how he, Tony Harrison, the son of a baker uh, from Leeds, who sort of ascends to teach in the grandest institutions in the land uh, and becomes a published poet, of course, how he, how he perceives uh, the world as a consequence of that transformation from one class to another, perhaps from, from one type of life to another type of life. Um, and so many of the poems could be considered quite bittersweet, and some of them are just plain angry as well. You'll probably enjoy those very much. I suspect you will. They're, they're, they're great poems. So those are the texts that we study. The final element of it is the coursework, the non-examined assessment entitled Theory and Independence, which is a, an apposite title because what it requires of you is to look at texts in relation to a particular theory, 
narrative, feminist, Marxist, eco-critical, post-colonial, or the canon, the literary value and the canon. Um, and look at that text and texts in relation to the theory and do it increasingly independently without your teacher telling you a huge amount. Now in our school, the way that we typically do it is that your teachers will teach um, some poetry and they'll ask that you write a piece of coursework based on that poetry um, on one of the theories. And then there is a second piece of coursework which is based on a prose text, usually a prose novel, um, where you have to choose a different theory. And that novel, that text that you choose is entirely down to you. It sometimes happens that teachers sort of give you a bit of a nudge in the right direction if you're struggling to make a choice, but it works fantastically well when you have a text in mind uh, and you go away and write about it. What do you write? How much do you write? Um, will be provided in more detail, but essentially it's this. You have two pieces of coursework, uh, the first of which is between 1250 and 1500 words, not including uh, bibliography or quotations, and you write away. So let's imagine, for instance, that you look at the poetry of Percy Shelley uh, and you look at it from the perspective of a Marxist um, theorist. That would then leave you the opportunity to write any one uh, about any one of the other five theories for your prose novel. So if you choose to study uh, the poetry of Percy Shelley and look at it from the through the lens of Marxist theory, then you may choose something like um, Colour Purple uh, and you may look at that through either something like uh, a feminist theoretical lens or a post-colonialist lens or uh, the literary value or narrative theory. Uh, the reason I choose The Colour Purple by Alice Walker, partly because many students have chosen it over the last number of years, but because of its flexibility. Um, the text is written by a woman and explores the female experience in the 1960s and 1950s and 60s in, in the US, and consequently can be viewed through that feminist lens. The text is for, written in the form of letters, so as a series of epistles, and therefore we could look at it from the perspective of narrative theory. Um, how is the story told to us? Alice Walker uh, is a black woman writing about a, the experience of being a black woman um, in part, of course it's fictionalized, it's not her life, it's, it's, a, it's a made up story. But her background uh, and her, her experiences in the US can be explored through that post-colonial lens. What does it mean to be um, a marginalized figure in society? Um, what does it suggest about the world in which you live to, to write about that experience? How would the text be different were it written by somebody who looked and sounded like me? Um, could it be authentic? Could it be true and real and uh, credible? And then the last one, which applies obviously to that text, I think is the literary canon which essentially is asking, is it any good or not? Does it belong to, to greatness? Should it be studied in school? Should it be studied in universities? Um, is it great? And if so, why? What makes it great? What makes it art? What makes it worthy of our time? These are the kinds of things that you, you may begin to look at. The last of them, which I haven't touched upon at all, is that of uh, eco-critical theory, which seeks to explore the nature of the environment, the way that the natural world is presented. Um, so that's a more uh, recent development in literary theory um, and a fascinating one as well. We move on. It explains there what you do. Um, so I'll leave that on the screen just for you to have a read of for a few seconds. We can remember, of course, that you can press pause and look at it that way. So perhaps press pause. If I move on, there you're explained um, how many words you have to, sort of, how many words you have to play with to write. 
uh, these essays. So if you're alarmed by 1,250 to 1,500 words and you think of it as a uh, rather a large number of words, um, I will say it here and say it now that typically the challenge is keeping the essay down beneath that. Um, you are very likely to struggle to keep it brief enough rather than struggle to find the words, to fill the word count. Here is an example of a question. This one is provided by the exam board um, and focuses on the theory that looks at the text, a passage to India through the lens of uh, post-colonial criticism. Forster, E. M. Forster, has written a passage to India in such a way that it is impossible to sympathize with any of the English characters as there is so little to redeem them. Using ideas from the critical anthology to inform your argument, to what extent do you agree with this view? That's exactly the type of question we will look for you to pursue because it does the most important thing of the lot, which is it sets up uh, an interesting debate. And that's what these A-level pieces of coursework are designed to do, give you the room to explore an interesting idea and to discuss and to debate it in the written form on a piece of paper. The last bullet point there refers to something called the critical anthology uh, and that's something that we provide to you uh, from the exam board to enable you to look at those theories, narrative theory, feminist theory, Marxist theory and so on. Uh, it provides an introduction to each of those theories and you are essentially allowed to use that uh, and manipulate it to discuss whatever text it is that you choose. And we'll coming to the end of this particular video, uh, and what we have here are the, the five assessment criteria. Now, curiously, perhaps, I'm going to start with AO5 because the exam boards uh, are keen to tell us that that's the most important uh, of them. What does AO5 mean? AO means assessment objective. Uh, there are five assessment objectives. Now, the important thing to know about this is that these things, these assessment objectives, these criteria, um, they are important, but they are not things to be ticked uh, either. It's not a tick box exercise. Um, we don't want a paragraph where you do AO5 and a, and a different paragraph where you do AO2. Wonderful writing tends to do all of these things at the same time. At the minute, what you can see on the screen is exam speak, but let's go through them. AO5 means to debate and discuss. AO4 is to consider um, context, uh, but also how the writer's work fits into a, into a genre, how it fits into its time period. Um, it's about connections, as it says there. AO3 uh, is about contexts more specifically, so the context of the author, the context of the time, um, the context within, within which the text operates as a whole. AO2 is effectively meaning to analyse language, structure and form and, and how they shape meanings. So why does the writer use that word? That's language. Why does the writer put those words in that order? That's structure. Uh, why does the writer choose this particular form of poetry? Why have they gone for the sonnet perhaps? Um, why have they gone for the epic poem or the dramatic monologue? Why? 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 Uh, and then the first one is write well, answer the question really sharply, um, use appropriate terminology. It's reasonably straightforward stuff. The most important thing of the lot though would be that if you have this question on, on in front of you, something like this, that you answer it. Can you sympathise with the English characters? Yes, no, why, why not? Um, is it something in the middle perhaps that you can both sympathise with them and not sympathise with them? Uh, why, why not? Do that, answer the question, include some text to justify your points, discuss those bits of text that you include uh, and, and then you're doing your job. It's a remarkably simple thing. 
Now, the one task that we'd actually like you to do as a consequence of this video is uh, do some watching. And the watching that we'd like you to do, uh, it need not be done between now and the end of this particular term, July the 17th, uh, but it should be done before you come to school in September. The BBC recently created a fantastic documentary series called Novels That Shaped Our World. The three episodes focused on class, the first one. The second one was that uh, which focused on colonialism, the role of empire, and the third uh, prioritised women writers, women readers, women in literature. Um, you will see some reasonably famous faces uh, doing some readings and sort of performances of, of the text. Um, but genuinely a, a really interesting um, documentary series to watch. Um, so that's the first thing we'd li like you to do is, is to watch it. As you watch it, make notes, um, perhaps take notes of the, the texts that they're discussing, because in many respects, they're the kinds of texts that we'd ask that you consider for your uh, NEA, your non-examined assessment coursework uh, pieces. Uh, to watch this, you will need TV license or your parents will um, and you will need to sign up uh, registered to the BBC iPlayer service. Uh, other than that it's a case of enjoying it uh, and so that's it we'll leave it there for this particular time this one as I say focuses on um, the exam specification um, and so not the most exciting of these videos perhaps because it doesn't necessarily discuss literature itself but it does re-emphasize what it is we're focusing on which is why is English literature uh, such a fantastic subject because the text that we choose we strongly believe um, enable you to visit worlds beyond your own and shed light in which uh, that shed light on the world in which you already live. That's it for now thanks very much uh, and we'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.